Um, welcome to today's uh, seminar. It's the first in our sustainability seminar series for this semester. And uh, we will be focusing on sustainable electronics um, this fall. And I want to ask uh, all of those attending to hold your questions to the end. And then we'll, we'll have time for questions after both speakers. And then for those uh, viewing and listening online, we'll also um, take a look at the questions you type in at the end also. So um, all of the seminars will be archived on our website for viewing later. And we have past seminars from the last four years also there, if you're interested in those. I have the entire seminar scheduled for the fall it's over on the side table for those who are. Uh, others can see that on our website. Today's presentation is entitled, Electronic Waste, Our Problem and What We Can Do About It. Uh, we have two speakers. Uh, the first will be William Bullock, who is Professor of Industrial Design and Director of the Product uh, Interaction Research Laboratory of Pearl here on campus. And Pearl links education and research design in the classroom, where advanced students from engineering, design, and marketing can collaborate to conduct uh, product development studies for industry. And he's also an affiliate faculty member here at ISTC, where his current research focuses on design for the environment and development of sustainable product designs and work with our Sustainable Electronics Initiative. Uh, Bill teaches classes in undergrad and graduate courses in product design, and his career spans over 30 years with uh, and include direction and advancement of industrial design programs here at the University of Illinois, uh, Georgia Institute of Technology, and Auburn University. He's an active fellow in the Industrial Designers Society of America, a National Association of Schools of Art and Design Accreditation Evaluator. Bill earned his BFA in Industrial Design at Auburn University and his MFA in Design at University of Kansas. He's been here at the U of I since 2000. The second speaker uh, today will be Joyce Scrollum, who's the Emerging Technology Research Specialist here at ISTC. She works with our uh, Glipper program, which is the Great Lakes Regional Pollution Prevention Roundtable on expansion of the receptor resources and website. And in addition to her duties with Glipper, she works on product development and website content coordination for the Sustainable Electronics Initiative. And she's the main force behind the coordination of the annual International E-Waste Design Competition, which William uh, first started with one of his classes. And Joy is continuing. This is the third year that we have the, as an international contest. Joy will discuss a little bit about that in her presentation. We also write blogs related to these projects and, and for ISTC in general. She earned her BS degree in liberal arts and scientists, sciences and biology and an MS in natural resources and environmental sciences here at Illinois. She's been here at ISTC since 2001. So with that, I'll introduce William Bullock to begin, begin his presentation. William? Uh, thank you, Nancy, for that uh, very nice introduction, and it's a real pleasure for me to uh, uh, share lunch with you a bit, and uh, uh, although I'll have mine following the talk, I um, uh, have had a, uh, a very nice relationship and very good support um, um, here at the Illinois Sustainable Technology Center, and uh, much of what um, I have uh, helped initiate uh, is due to a real team effort uh, with our um, new director we have as well as uh, my colleagues and uh, the colleague that I'm sharing the podium with today, uh, George Strogum. So uh, uh, I wanted to talk a little, little bit uh, today just to touch, uh, touch on uh, the, the topic of electronic waste uh, and try to underscore the, the, the aspect the, or the, uh, the uh, the, the issue that it's really our collective problem. It's a problem that needs to be uh, attacked from a number of different uh, angles and, and a number of different levels. So I wanted to uh, give you a little bit of my thinking on that and what maybe what we can collectively begin to do about it. And, uh, um, let's see how, if I can, I'm not able to advance uh, on that, so I'll go to uh, Plan B here. So that doesn't seem to work. Okay. 
Okay. Usually you go with the keys up and down. There we go. The keys there, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, wonderful technology is always uh, somewhat baffling, and I, I always uh, blame my profession for that, industrial design. We are supposed to make these things a lot easier to work with and use, uh, and perhaps that's part of the problem of the electronic waste, if something doesn't function as it, as it should function. But um, uh, just a, a very brief definition, my definition of, of electronic waste is essentially just the discarded heaps of electronics that we have, uh, includes old computers, cell phones are some of the biggest uh, contributors, um, other electronics, um, almost any plug-in device now has begun to be classified as, as kind of electronics and, and a waste of some, of some kind. But we're focusing specifically on, on, the, on the topic of, of electronic, uh, um, electronic waste. Uh, and it's really been driven by uh, primarily the Western industrial nations, although the rest of the world is, is catching up now. Uh, this has uh, obviously diminished our natural resources, uh, brought about uh, much environmental degradation. And you can certainly uh, read uh, the newspaper is always full of uh, stories about uh, our concerns. Uh, recent uh, uh, weather patterns are, are being attributed to some of the uh, results of, of uh, you know, too much carbon in the atmosphere, those things, whether you believe it's global warming or not, uh, it's, it's hard to dispute that the temperatures are rising, and this stuff can't be good. It's uh, no humans have ever lived on this planet with as much carbon in the atmosphere as we now have, so it's, it's, it's cause for more alarm. Uh, but much of the problem with electronics is the fact that it, it winds up in landfills where it does really nobody much good uh, at all. Uh, or it else is ground up into scrap, where it's really tried, you try to turn it back into sand from which it came, uh, and that's just a, a terrible waste of resources and, and embedded energy and the uh, lost computer chips and other things that uh, were um, very energy intensive to manufacture in the first place. So, um, uh, and, and the other thing is, uh, from an ethical standpoint, we've done much of this on the shores of our neighbors around the world. Although that probably is going to come to an end fairly quickly because uh, China, India, other developing um, uh, industrial powers are um, going to have their own e-waste problem very shortly, uh, and it's going to exceed uh, the Western nations, which is quite astounding with the amount of, of e-waste. So um, it's the current wasteful paradigm of, uh, you know, by a number of estimates from the EPA and others, they're, they're huge amounts of, of, of these, uh, these products that we waste. Um, uh, approximately two-thirds of when we replace products, we're, we're not good stewards about hanging on to things. We seem to uh, like newness um, and, and get rid of things prematurely. So uh, fully two-thirds, by some estimates, are still in, in good working order. And, and I'm sure a lot of the others, or it could be with, with a little bit of repair, might be kept, uh, uh, kept in, in working order and still useful. I, I still use a flip phone, phone I'm, I'm looked at uh, as being out of sync. But I, I do uh, try to do what I, what I can, and I have an old laptop that weighs twice as much as, as what you can get a new laptop now. So the pressure is on always to get newer is better. But um, uh, uh, it, it is a premature throwing away of this stuff is, is really, really, really prob problematic. Um, the, um, uh, uh, and, and, the, and the other thing, if I look at, at, at the long-term perspective, I'm old enough now I can remember back 50 years ago, and, uh, uh, and, and by some estimates of the Gallup polls and others, happiness was, uh, in the United States, was, was number one in nations in terms of, of happiness, uh, judgment of happiness. And so, but in the intervening years, we've doubled the amount of stuff that we have, but we're, uh, we're, we're, we're less, less happy than we were. I think we last I looked, we were about 17th on the list in terms of, so the, the stuff not necessarily is making us Happier, it has done a lot to bring uh, nations out of poverty, give people employment around the world. So I'm not suggesting that, uh, that it's all been bad, but there's some bad part to it, and that's what I want to speak to you a little bit. Uh, so this is a problem that you've seen pictures. Uh, if you have not, uh, you know, it, it runs hot and cold in the news, but they're all, all over the news um, and, and the web if you want to look about just an example of the, the current wasteful paradigm. And I'm particularly... Um, uh, disturbs me because a lot of the products that my profession designs wind up here uh, in product design. So uh, it's not a good legacy uh, uh, for, for us as a nation or, or, or um, and it, again, it's just it's very wasteful to be put away there. Uh, you've got 
just to review uh, very quickly, you've got the, the circuit boards uh, obviously contain toxic materials and, and the stuff which is not good if it gets out, uh, although with new landfill designs, probably not as much gets out, but that is not the case in some of the developing nations where uh, you do have unregulated uh, open pit burnings and, and other reclamation, rudimentary reclamation methods, which are harmful to health. And then one area in Gaou, China, uh, my apologies if I don't quite get that pronunciation right, uh, I understand now they have to pump fresh water from about uh, 20 miles away uh, into that, that region because the uh, soil and water has become so contaminated. And certainly uh, that, that is a problem, but I think the other, one of the major problems is just this value valuable stuff is just put away and, and, and uh, is not reclaimed or, or when it is, if there's some real problems with it. Um, uh, and of course the ethical concern that I've, I've already mentioned. Uh, if I hearken back a little bit, as I remember, I like to remember, uh, and of course memory can be, be uh, uh, faulted sometimes, but I remember growing up in the 50s and 60s in the back of my radio, my dad's radio and TV repair shop, I actually uh, uh, couldn't find an exact picture. It looked very similar to this one, though, in a, in a small town, in a southern town. And the interior looked very similar to the interior picture here. The other picture with the flagpole is that shop that's a little hard to see, uh, but uh, that was a radio and TV repair shop that I had uh, great fun. Uh, and one of my jobs was to take stuff apart and reclaim it. Uh, we had literally boxes and heaps and piles of wires and tubes and old things that they were still in working order that was part of a, uh, the genre of, uh, of continual you know, use and making use of those particular products. So whether it was exactly that way, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, maybe uh, historians could tell us, but that's what I remember, and it was a, a very nice way to grow up. And so I still remember you know, getting maybe one major thing, uh, that little electronic uh, um, radio was the first one that, that came to our town, and my dad won it at a raffle and gave it to me, and I was a proud kid to to own that way back in the lower right there. Um, uh, but uh, the, the products were, were generally, I think, made to, uh, to last for the most part. You repaired. There was a whole, um, in one six-block area that I grew up in, there were, um, I think, three um, hardware stores, uh, two doctor's offices, two dentist's offices, two pharmacies, um, two feed stores, um, uh, uh, two electronic radio and TV repair uh, stores, um, on and on and on, and there was a whole network of, of, of really based on repair and reutilization of the product. Obviously, we can't turn back the clock, and maybe it wasn't as good as I remember, but that's what I would like to see us begin to embrace some of those notions of quality and, and longevity and use of products. And uh, as I mentioned a little bit a few minutes ago, uh, my profession, I, I really think, is part of the problem as well. So I'll be a little bit self-criticizing here. Is we create the things you see and touch on the products. We get a little bit more than skin deep because we like to understand the user, the user experience. Of course, more and more of that user experience is on a flat screen. So why would you buy one product over another? They all look the same except they're a little bit different color, and the branding is a little different with the brand logo on it. But essentially, they do the same thing. So uh, this may be ushering in and begin to usher in a new paradigm, a new way of thinking about our electronic purchases, and I'll touch on that a little bit more in a minute. But uh, it's certainly predicated on cheap oil, and the, the recent predictions of reclamation of uh, energy independence now, simply because they're going to pump steam and other things into the oil fields and get more out, uh, that's, uh, that, that's, that's well and good. But there, it just has to be, in my opinion, uh, some better alternatives uh, to this, uh, simply more is better, and uh, using up our finite resources in such a wasteful manner. Uh, and essentially, we have a one-way system where things are used. Uh, one estimate uh, that I read recently, uh, approximately 90% of what we buy is uh, a month or two later, 90 days, I think, uh, is, is in the landfill. Uh, we're just very wasteful, and uh, so... Uh, uh, maybe the more expensive oil, the more expensive energy is going to help us uh, begin to realize that we do have finite resources and we need to be better stewards and better uh, use of, of this material. So um, uh, what we need, obviously, is, uh, is William McDonough has talked about in, in his book, uh, uh, Cradle to Cradle is, uh, you know, a, a more closed-loop system where we can re re reutilize and minimize the concept of waste, waste perhaps uh, entirely. Uh, here's one particular opportunity that uh, we've, we've talked about 
here at, at, uh, at the Illinois Sustainable Technology Center through our Sustainable Electronics Initiative. And it's just one, one small example, and it's, uh, it's a little old maybe now in terms of I couldn't find a more recent version of this, but uh, if you just look at, at this just in reclamation terms of, of, of trying to recycle and reuse things, uh, you know, and we're talking about needing jobs now, we just did a better job. There, there's great potential in just reusing the stuff and, and repairing it, uh, as some people are doing and some of our associates that work with us here. Um, uh, on the uh, uh, Sustainable Electronics Initiative are, are actually doing that, and my hat goes off to, is off to, off to them as well. But if you look at the statistics here, you know, it's uh, what if you thought about a different paradigm, which uh, uh, if we hang on to things 10 times longer, 20, 100, what if you hung on to it forever and you just kept reusing it? Uh, that almost, is, in my opinion, is what's happening with electronics because the value now is on the screen not the value of the thing itself, except that they're getting so thin, you almost have to keep thick enough so they actually uh, have some physical presence. And we can make things so small. And we can do Dick Tracy you know, things on, on the watch, but some of those things are just not practical to see and to operate in a convenient way. So uh, so I think we need, obviously, I would encourage us to really think collectively about uh, the need for a, a less wasteful paradigm. Uh, so what can we do uh, individually and collectively? Uh, obviously, become better informed. <laughs> Uh, educate ourselves. I know many of you, uh, perhaps here today, are already doing this, and I compliment you on that. Or perhaps if you weren't interested in this topic, you wouldn't be here today. So uh, congratulations. Uh, keep up the good work. Um, uh, we need to uh, do the larger picture of support electronic waste policy and laws and regulations. Somewhat more than one half the states uh, only have regulations on the regulations of this stuff. All the other states, you can simply throw stuff in the trash. And, and again, it's going to wind up in the land well for it. It's just wasteful and, and not a good paradigm. Part of the problem, my problem of my profession anyway, is we didn't design the stuff in the first place so it could be reclaimed and reused. That is beginning to change, and my hat is off to Dell Computer. Um, uh, their competition as well and others uh, in the electronics business are, are starting to do this. But we are in the driver's seat if we inform ourselves and make wise purchases to help control what we get. In many cases, these companies are responding to us, so we can't always put the problem over there. The problem, I think, in many ways comes back to us as individual consumers and, uh, you know, the lack of uh, not being informed or just being plain wasteful with what we have, always wanting bigger is better. So uh, more sustainable, wise purchases, uh, that requires being informed because you have a lot of greenwashing, a lot of companies that say they do stuff, and this is greener than that. It's an extremely complicated problem. And it's often you can delve below the surface of it and try to find out what the real truth is. But there are some inroads and some uh, important uh, things that are going on now that, that, is, that is good that hopefully is going to lead us into a new paradigm for use of this uh, material. I would say quality matters. Uh, we always uh, go on price a lot, and, and that's normal. If you only have so much uh, fixed income to spend. But, uh, uh, again, do we need... Uh, uh, one of those things uh, quite so often, and can we buy a better quality machine or, or at least the press industry to give us better quality? Um, so uh, it's that more, more is better philosophy, which I think has gotten us into this problem a bit. Now, we talk about growing the economy. Maybe that's uh, going, to, going to grow, but I think the economy is going to grow in smaller nodes, not in sweeping. Uh, that's my own uh, experience, and I think as innovation become, comes from individuals like yourselves sitting here and innovative ways of thinking about things. So, um, uh, so longevity, uh, you know, recycle responsibly, try to find out the best information you can. Uh, and then I would say, you know, try to support uh, research and education programs like uh, SEI here at the Illinois Sustainable Technology Center. I think it's one of the, the best programs in the nation that is trying to begin to do something about this problem by, by being a lightning rod for information, current information, and uh, a um, – a, uh, a networking base, so to speak, and uh, my, uh, my colleague, uh, George Kogan, is going to talk a little bit about that uh, and some of the things that we're doing here in just a minute when she comes up. Um, uh, transforming education, certainly important. We have uh, people here, at the, some of the colleagues here at, at SEI go to talk to middle schools about the problems of electronic waste. It's very important. Uh, the uh, show and tell that uh, the, the – uh, um, that the unit has uh, each year, along with other, other units um, here, uh, to talk about what they're doing and how research is making a difference, because those are going to be the future 
policymakers and the future designers that are going to help deal with this problem. And uh, so back to my uh, area, transform product design uh, is what I'm trying to, uh, to, to help out with. Um, but again, it's a huge problem. Um, but, uh, and then the one that's really, uh, that we do have some say so is transforming your own uh, consumer. Uh, and by that, we can transform corporate behavior. So we are in a real power position if we collectively act and get others to act in responsible ways. So uh, um, uh, key, key um, um, uh, topic that I'll just add here is, is to order to change, we have to innovate. And that's where our university is a key ingredient in this, in this area because that's where a lot of the bright young minds and leaders are going to come from. So anything we can do to provide opportunities for innovation, to teach people how to innovate, and to teach uh, these young minds um, um, you know, what the issues are and how to deal with them, again, in a creative way. So, uh, so the uh, uh, Sustainable uh, Electronics Initiative, uh, you know, the partnership with that, I would encourage everybody to find out. Again, Joey can give you a little bit of current things that we're doing in just a moment, and uh, I'll just put in a plug for her. Uh, if she's going to come up in just a second, but that's kind of the uh, the goal of the uh, initiative here um, that is being revised and and, and uh, responding to, to policy and, and possibilities at this point. One of the things that I particularly enjoyed uh, over the years is involving uh, uh, students in my research, and I've continued to do that with my partnership with the Sustainable Electronics Initiative. So I actually kind of have two labs depending on what the problem is. Uh, but they work uh, very similar in the same same way. And it's been a great partnership here with the excellent facilities that we're now speaking in, and that's where this particular picture was taken. Um, what we do is uh, we uh, um, uh, do product development studies for industry, essentially. And uh, if we have the capability to look at it through sustainable eyes and to make recommendations to companies to do studies for that, um, we bring together design, business, and technology resources. We link those from the university, work on these particular problems. Most of the research is proprietary. These are very serious, high-level studies in, in the most, most, most cases. Um, some that are not proprietary. George is going to tell you a little bit about those. Uh, so we do, do both, but, but the emphasis is on, on very serious studies uh, and, and the cross-functional uh, faculty and students research teams. Um, we bring the technical engineering skills, which is what this university is really noted for in, in many ways, along with other ex excellence. Uh, we marriage that with the customer-driven focus uh, and the understanding of industrial design and marketing, the two more customer-driven disciplines. And then, and then um, so we, we partner together with that and investigate real-world real world problems. And it's uh, a lot, a lot of, we have a lot of fun. Here's some, some, some photographs of uh, some of that uh, work that was here in this particular room. Um, this is um, uh, a Fortune 500 company executive uh, sitting in, in, in the near corner there on the uh, left bottom. Uh, she approved that it's okay for me to use this particular slide. So most, there's one of my colleagues there in the background uh, is doing some innovation studies and coming up with new ideas. Companies literally get hundreds of ideas that have to develop and improve new products. Uh, we also um, Last year, I, I actually uh, counted the number of nationalities we had in the room. There were, were nine nationalities represented on a team of about 20, 19 to 20 students. So that's one of the advantages of coming to the university is we get we can look at things through cultural lenses as well as discipline lenses to work on this particular problem. And I say I, I just love it. I have a lot of fun with it, and I think I have a waiting list now of students trying to get involved in these things. So we welcome uh, industry uh, possibilities, and with the great resources we have here at the uh, Sustainable uh, Technology uh, you know, Center here, the Illinois Sustainable Technology Center, uh, uh, we can really bring some firepower, mental firepower uh, and excellence to bear on some of these challenging problems for industry. Uh, so um, uh, again, I've kind of reviewed uh, the innovation aspects of that. Uh, benefits to education, just to summarize very quickly, uh, the students get experience as well as faculty to keep current by working on existing problems, real problems for industry. It's not fuzzy, fuzzy uh, 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 theoretical problems that, uh, that are fine in certain aspects for learning, but these are real, uh, real problems. Um, uh, these, we have access to industry experts and resources in many ways that support industry. In some cases, is leading education. We like to think we, we try to lead it in other ways. 
but it's a real collaboration. So the collaborative learning opportunities for students and faculty, I learn each time I do one of these. Um, and the students get, uh, obviously, are exposed to leadership opportunities to help direct micro teams and, and other uh, ways of working on these products, on these projects. Uh, the uh, benefits also is the companies get objective viewpoints. We're not in the day-to-day -day business of doing what they do, so we're going to tell them what we find out, research. And I can remember the CEO is not liking what we told them in some cases, but that's honesty. We, that's what we reported. That's what we found out. And we said, well, you don't need another widget. What you do, what you do need is better service for the widget that you have. And uh, uh, the uh, uh, CEO actually actually did listen to us eventually on, on that, that point. So um, uh, uh, employment opportunities, uh, students can go on. Uh, companies can work with uh, and get exposed to some of the top talent in the nation that we have here at the University of Illinois and uh, can go on to hire those individuals, which is a great uh, opportunity as well. And it simply builds good synergistic relationships with our alumni and others that, uh, that, that, that uh, stay in touch with us only. And then back to industry, um, uh, the, uh, we've got, uh, we can look at different lenses, collaborative teams, work on these things. We're, we're, uh, we're, we're non-denominational, so to speak, territory here, neutral territory here. Um, uh, and by uh, the same, same uh, token, uh, they have access to some of the experts uh, here in certain areas and leading, leading theor theoretical and applied knowledge. Um, uh, objective viewpoint, again, as I mentioned already, uh, cost effective. It doesn't cost a lot, I think. It's just one of the best deals going. Uh, we do charge, uh, uh, but uh, uh, we do take overhead out of it, and, and it's fully we, we look at it as, as applied research. Uh, and I think it's an excellent return on investment for industry. So if you're interested in any more of, of that, uh, certainly I'll just put in a plug. Uh, please contact us, uh, me or my colleagues here uh, uh, at, uh, at ISTC. And so with that, I'll introduce my uh, colleague and let her kind of wrap things up, talking about some of the exciting uh, work that they're in progress now and some of the recent things we've done. So Uh, well, there are two main components of SEI, um, as William has mentioned. We are interested in conducting and sponsoring research related to all aspects of the electronic product life cycle, and we're also interested in education, um, both education of the public in terms of making better consumer choices, um, also education of manufacturers in terms of making process improvements, but most importantly, since we're here on the campus of the University of Illinois, we're, we're very interested in, in infusing the concepts of sustainability into the curricula and educational experiences of current university students in a variety of disciplines that will have some role to play in the future creation and management of electronic products in the future, um, whether it be industrial designers, engineers, computer scientists, marketing students, um, even psychology students in terms of you know, what, what goes into why we become attached to electronic devices or why we want to have the latest and greatest things, policymakers. So we're really interested in, in coming up with educational opportunities for university students. And I will talk about our main educational um, project, which is our e-waste design competition, and just briefly touch on three current research projects that are underway. Um, I will forewarn you that my my slides will be a little text dense because these slides will be available for download on our website after the fact and I want them to be coherent, but I'll do my best not to bore you too much and, and try not to read through them, so don't, don't go cross-eyed trying to read along. Um, the International E-Waste Design Competition grew out of a class taught by William Bullock here at UIUC back in 2009. It was a class on e-waste issues in which the students sort of looked at the problem in general and, and explored all aspects of the issue. Um, and as part of their class experience, they held a local collection event for used electronics. And from those used electronics, they created new and useful product, products that could be made from the scrap. Um, there were two categories back in 2009. One was artist slash designer, which was focused more on the aesthetic sorts of projects, and geek slash technical, which was for more technical projects. Since then, we've modified the categories a bit. Um, we still have a category that's focused on e-waste reuse, 
But since we are a pollution prevention agency and we're interested in not just the end of the product life cycle, but all aspects of the product life cycle, we have a category that's also focused on e-waste prevention. So that's for products and services that are geared toward extending the useful product life cycle of electronic devices. So say um, creating a modularly designed laptop so that parts could be more easily taken out and replaced. That would hopefully make that product more useful for a longer period of time and therefore um, reduce the amount of e-waste that's generated in the first place. Uh, in that first year in 2009, the competition is open not just to students in Williams class, but to the entire campus of UIUC. Um, it was such a successful event that the directors of SEI in subsequent years decided to make it an international competition. So we went from local to international. Why not? Um, and because we couldn't have people shipping us their prototypes from all corners of the world, the submission process then became an online process in which the main component was a YouTube video describing design concepts. And that's still the main component of submissions, along with a project description, bibliographies of references, and proof of eligibility for team members. And the details of all that are available on the competition website as listed at the top of the slide. Um, as I said, uh, we have two main categories, waste prevention and waste reuse. Entries can be made by individuals or teams of up to five people. Um, and registration is free and open to current college students as well as recent graduates. Um, submissions for this year are currently being accept, uh, accepted. Registration opened on September 1st and will close on November 1st. So when you register, you get a login and password. And you can access your account at any time throughout that registration period and add to it. But when the deadline hits at 4.59 p.m. on November 1st, Central Time, that login pa and password won't work anymore. So it's an online you can pick up wherever you left off in your, in your submission or your entry, but once the deadline hits, you won't be able to access it anymore. Um, students can be from any discipline. They don't have to be industrial designers or engineers. We've had art students submit things in the past and medical students. Um, there will be three winning projects selected by jurors in each of the two categories for a total of six winning projects. We typically get about 30 complete entries from six to seven different countries around the world, including the U.S. And not just William, but professors at various institutions throughout the country have used the competition as a course project for their students, particularly in industrial design courses. I know this year that uh, this year's competition has been used as a class project at, for a class in the spring at California State University at Long Beach, and those students have been encouraged to keep their course projects and to submit them in this year's competition is false. So I'm looking forward to see what they came up with. Join Virginia Tech. I just learned the other day. Also. Oh, cool. Great. Um, as I said, registration is open. There are cash awards for winning entries. We're very grateful to Dell Incorporated for their corporate sponsor sponsorship of the competition. Um, first prize will receive $3,000, second prize $2,000, and third prize $1,000 in each of the two categories. And in addition to being grateful to our sponsors, we're also very grateful every year to the experts who serve as our jurors. Um, this year that's comprised of Jason O'Neill, who's the Executive Director of the National Center for Electronics Recycling, uh, Chris Newman from the Materials Management Branch of US EPA, Bill Olson, who's the Director of the Office of Sustainability and Stewardship for Mobile, mobile, mobile Devices, Stephen Samuels from Recellular Incorporated, which is a company that refurbishes cell phones, and Kirsten Wilson-Strong, who's the design chair for the Industrial Designers Society of America. At the end of the submission process, they take their time to review all the complete submissions and to debate about which ones they think are best, and so we're very grateful to them for their time. And at the end of the competition, um, in early December, I think perhaps December 4th, we will host a sustainability seminar like this one in which we will announce the winners. So be on the lookout for details about that. Um, in addition to gaining cash prizes, uh, the competition has received a lot of press interest over the years from the likes of Discovery News, Green News, etc. So you could get a little notoriety if you're a student who's interested in enter entering besides the, the chance to win a cash prize. Uh, pictures and videos from previous year's winners are available on the competition website as well as on the SEI YouTube channel, which I've listed here. And if you have any questions about uh, possibly entering or if you're a professor and are interested in incorporating this into a class or interested in, in being a corporate sponsor in, in subsequent years, please don't hesitate to contact me. Um, 
And then I'll just briefly touch on three current research projects. One of them, the New Life for Laptops project, has also been sponsored by Dell Incorporated. Um, and it's, it's sort of, a, it's, it's like a pool lab project in um, William's uh, Pearl Lab, in which a, a corporate sponsor has come and, and presented a problem for students to address. And the students have come up with design um, solutions to that problem. Um, Dell, of course, has its own recycling initiative, and they often receive laptops from which the hard drives have been removed for data security purposes, either from government agencies or industry. And so um, they, they asked the group of students who were team taught by William, Cliff Shin, who's also from industrial design, Brian Lilly from the College of Engineering, and Paul Young from Business Administration, to look at these laptops sans hard drives and come up with ways to use the technology in those laptops for new applications um, beyond the obvious of put in a new hard drive and make it a functioning laptop again. What else could you do with that technology? Uh, so the students were multidisciplinary teams from the various uh, disciplines represented by the professors. Uh, they broke up into groups with different um, individuals from each of those, those disciplines. And they came up with various just a slew of potential solutions that they ran by a couple of individuals from Dell, um, Mike Watson, who's the director of compliance, and John Fluger, who's the principal environmental strategist, took a lot of their own time to provide feedback and guidance to the students. Um, and after hearing many of their ideas, they decided and giving feedback about what would be feasible in the real world, what might be feasible in terms of the market perspective and infrastructure perspectives as, as a corporation. Um, they suggested that the students focus on their agricultural-based applications, both because here we are in Illinois in the sea of farmland, of course, and because of the agricultural education history of the IBC. So given that focus, the, the students focused on four types of ideas that they presented to Dell at the end of the semester. Um, they had ideas that were related to education and training, such as coming up with kiosks that could be placed throughout a farm, both for use by farmers to track systems or to um, provide training to people working on the farm. They also thought about um, training or providing education to the public who might visit farms, like the Student Sustainability Farm here on campus. Um, they, they looked at animal care and management. For instance, they, they talked about using LCD monitors to expose chickens to specific wavelengths of light, which then, in theory, would increase egg production. That was one of their more interesting ideas. Um, they proposed creating a sea of sensors for an automated system that would automatically irrigate farm fields. And they also talked about an, an equipment subscription service for farmers, because, of course, farmers need to use technology out in the field but they might not necessarily want to have the latest, greatest, most expensive laptop or device out in the elements and being beat up. So they, they talked about refurbishing this used equipment and then providing it for use by farmers. And then if there was any damage, they could easily swap out and replace the, the equipment at, at minor cost. So at the end of the semester, they presented their best ideas to Dell, and they also presented their ideas in a sustainability seminar like this one, which is archived on our website, if you care to, to watch it or download those slides. We'd like to um, continue the educational opportunities of this project in the future when we've talked to professors such as Cliff Shin, who was one of the original uh, instructors, um, William, of course, and our own mom, Dr. Monhart Kilkarni, we might work with independent study students. We've also explored um, the possibility of working with professors in the College of Agricultural, Consumer, and Environmental Sciences on a course that will be taught in spring 2013, which is an agricultural engineering um, capstone design course. And with the idea that new groups of students could either take those ideas that were generated this past spring and create prototypes that could then be tested or they might generate new ideas and, and possibly investigate other aspects of the ideas that were um, proposed by the original group of students. For example, if we had an independent study student in business, they might look at you know, the market aspects or the marketability of certain, of certain um, 
ideas that were presented by the original group of students. So we're hoping to continue um, using this challenge as an educational opportunity for students on the campus of UIDC. And then two other projects that I'll briefly talk about that are sponsored by the ISTC Sponsored Research Program. And both of them have to do with surveying and investigating policy regarding purchasing and disposal of electronic products. The first is being conducted by the Delta Institute and the Green Electronics Council. The Green Electronics Council is the uh, organization that administers the EP product registry, product registry program. Uh, they will be conducting surveys and interviews of members of industry and organizations um, looking into purchasing um, decisions by purchasing agents to see if there are policies in place among these organizations for incorporating end-of-life management uh, considerations into purchase of electronic products. Um, if there are policies, what works best, what are best management practices that they can glean from, from these individuals or these organizations that already have policies in place. If there aren't policies in place, what are the barriers to having policies? What are the challenges that purchasers have to face in, in terms of selecting electronic products? And um, just looking at the disposal process in general. And they'll be identifying through um, their interviews organizations that plan to make purchases in the near future. So basically within their project period. This project is ongoing through spring of 2013 and they will um, identify up to five interviewees which they will then guide through the process of making an electronic product purchase using the EP registry and using some of the best management practices that they identify through their initial survey. And ideally, the end outcome of this project will be to help those five um, interviewees develop their own policy related to purchasing and disposal of electronic products. A similar project, which isn't geared toward industry but geared toward academia, is a project that we'll be doing internally on uh, looking at the staff of the Prairie Research Institute, which is the institute that ISTC and the other scientific surveys are a part of here on campus. Um, we'll be doing an online survey and conducting focus groups of staff among the various divisions to see who is involved in making decisions related to the purchase of electronic products, uh, why certain products are, are chosen over others, if there are policy reasons for that, um, why decisions are made and how decisions are made with regard to scrapping or retiring electronic products, and if there are differences among the divisions, if so, which I'm sure there are, what are the reasons for those differences, and the end goal is to come up with some policy recommendations to make to the institute as a whole and to the divisions. And hopefully, long term, the goal would be that this pilot study could be used and extrapolated to other academic units on campus that would be interested in uh, greening their own product choices and disposal um, policies. So um, with that, we'll also be, i also like to mention with regard to this that the project will be overseen by a research assistant, a graduate research assistant, under the guidance of Dr. Bethany Cutts in the Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Sciences. We'll be posting that research assistantship opportunity on the Graduate College um, Assistantship Clearinghouse online very soon. But in the meantime, if you're watching this and you're a graduate student who might be interested in working on this, please don't hesitate to contact us. Um, and if there are any research projects that I've mentioned or other ideas that you have related to any aspect of electronic product lifecycle that you'd like to explore and collaborate on with us, please don't hesitate to contact either myself or Nancy Holm. She's the research coordinator for SEI. I'm the education coordinator. And again, I have the Noise Competition website posted, and the Sustainable Electronics Initiative website is www.sustainableelectronics.org. With that, I'll open the floor to any questions. Are there any questions from the audience? Yeah. No. So 
So one of the um, profound changes we had in our recent history is the use and promotion of cars, sorry, Model 3. And that has changed our society tremendously in you know, how we live and do our business. Electronics, in that regard, computers have changed our lives also significantly. Are there any parallels or differences that you see in terms of you know, how they handle this was a problem that it's a larger scale thing in terms of cost of data, but still you know, there are some lessons to be had and applied to the electronic industry. Could you rephrase the last part of your question? Last part is, uh, are there some uh, PMPs or best management practices from the auto industry that could be applied? Oh, certainly. Uh, the automotive industry, um, uh, at least the recycling end of that, is one of the better examples of recycling. You know, almost every piece of the car is, is made use of. It can be improved. And there are some of the European automobile uh, manufacturers that are ahead of us in terms of requiring take backs. You know, uh, and that I think at the front end is affecting design and design that can be reused, things that can be recycled. They're being a little more, more careful in terms of types of materials that are used. And also, yes, I think uh, certainly we can learn from uh, from the automotive industry and, and apply that to to the electronics uh, industry as well, the smaller products as well. Well, I, I think there are parallels um, just in terms of consumer behavior between electronic products and our attitudes toward cars, at least in the United States and Western society. Um, you know, in the past, as William talked about electronics, things used to be made to last, and you had that was a very special possession that you, you took good care of and kept for as long as possible. The same was true with, with, with vehicles when they first became came on the scene. And now today you see people wanting the latest and greatest car, the biggest, bigger is better, whether they need a big SUV or not. And there are definitely parallels between that sort of mentality from a consumer standpoint and our mentality toward electronic products where whether or not we need all of the features on our smartphone or not, we want it because it's the latest and greatest. And we have to have what's, what's new and what's best. And so there are a lot of parallels in terms of consumer attitudes that I think are interesting between electronic products and vehicles. How easy is it to recycle a cell phone or a laptop? Can you get a good percentage of that material back? Um, yes, you can. And there are actually, if you go to the SEI website, we do have uh, publications, a publication on how to recycle um, various products. There are take back and donation programs that are available um, on the website. Yeah, some uh, have mailers that you can actually mail in the phone for free uh, and get it recycled. But, uh, I think uh, uh, the reason sometimes we don't do that is concerned about what's in the phone or on the phone. But uh, some of the uh, more reliable sites uh, uh, seem to be do a good job of, of erasing and not letting data out. You can also go to your phone uh, uh, company supplier and have them erase all your, your data off of there before you send it back as well. So uh, I think somebody may be the microscope couldn't uh, couldn't get some data off there, but the chances are, are fairly minimal. So. And it actually depends. I mean, that's an interesting question from a consumer standpoint as well, because it depends on the manufacturer. Um, there's been recent controversy because of Apple's uh, designs um, related to iPhones and some of their other uh, products. They they tend to design things to to be very thin and very lightweight, but they have received a lot of um, flack recently because they tend to have specialized screws that you need the special tool that they produce in order to, to remove um, some of their latest um, notebooks have batteries that are glued in rather than um, put in the screws and that yeah, sort of thing. So, so depending on the design and what the motivations were for the manufacturer, um, in, that, in that particular instance, they're, they're trying to meet the goal of having a lightweight and very sleek looking device for the consumer rather than trying to meet the, the desire to have something that's highly recyclable. So um, as consumers, it's kind of our duty to let manufacturers know that that aspect of product, of product life cycle and product management is important to us and that we might make our decisions based upon that. Back to the intelligent choice to vote with your pocketbook. I've got a comment and a question. First, regarding automobiles, it seems that we've greatly increased the life of automobiles, especially the advent of the double force from Asia. Because it was unheard of to get 200,000 miles out of a car back when you were 
buying at a beach where you live now, that's routine almost. With regarding computers, in my computer history, you know, was born of uh, my obsolescence. So how how is that changing? Well, what's the impetus for computer companies you know, to try and get more like, people to get more life out of their computers when it was all based on by having to buy a new computer to keep up with software? Well, that's a tough one. I think it's it's a big, huge problem. It depends on what the profit motive motive is. It, it depends. Uh, Somewhat on, on the company uh, uh, being good stewards, you know, and offering us intelligent choices. Uh, but it also, again, depends, depends on us, a lot, you know, uh, demanding those choices as well. Uh, so that's through policy, uh, through uh, the U.S. laws that are beginning to change. Because even in Europe, uh, some of the laws and the uh, 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 regulations there have affected what's produced in this country because the company, in many cases, doesn't want to make two production lines. So uh, the uh, it's like Germany years ago with their uh, better human factors requirements on furniture and all is a parallel now to electronics and the European Union requiring things that are easy to take apart as well as easy to put together at the front end. And that's going to hopefully um, begin to change our industry. It is happening. It's just not happening as fast as I think some of us would like to see. Um, and you're right. Things do last longer. I mean, uh, computers now, you can sometimes drop it and get away with it. Uh, so it's, and you can pay a little more and get uh, you know they, they look draconian almost. Uh, so that's uh, you know, aesthetics don't match. So uh, one of the challenges I think uh, along with these improvements is a, is what I would say is a 21st century aesthetic. So newness and just a new polish on the outside doesn't always have to create the demand for more and more and more, more of what we have. How about the opportunity? Uh, so you're asking about funding, funding opportunities? opportunities. Yeah. Go, go ahead. Um, uh, we've, uh, uh, as part of our initial initiative, we, we had hopes of creating a, a, a center here. And uh, we've had to readjust that uh, for a little bit longer view. It, it's been tough to crack that, but that nut so far. Um, the times, I think, are changing. We would hope that um, uh, the federal grants and others, and, and there, there are granting agencies that, that, that um, uh, the specifics, however, of just for e-waste is, uh, you know, it's usually larger, larger uh, picture, sociological uh, issues, uh, humanities offer some possibilities. That's not exactly maybe what we need, but those individuals should be involved because they can help us answer why people are throwing this stuff away in the first place. Uh, and that's what uh, SEI and through the some of the research here on campus is trying to, uh, to, to get at that. Uh, I think we hope that that, that an issue, those small issues, that would lead to studies at the Department of Energy and other places that are larger, that uh, that they have to deal with, with information and, and why, are, why are computers you know, discarded prematurely? Is that automatic? Is that ever so often? Is that totally technology driven? Are there personal tipping points that we can discover. Uh, so we hope that I think some of the initial research here will lead to larger grants, but the idea always. Yeah. Well, what are the strengths and weaknesses of the EP certification program? Actually, EP isn't a certification program. It's a product registry certification program. That would imply that there's a third party that um, assesses the claims of the product or of the manufacturer and says that, yes, indeed, this product meets, lives up to these standards. Um, EP is actually a product registry where they have different levels that have um, different standards associated with them, and the manufacturers uh, create products that meet those levels, and then it's like a listing. It's kind of like a catalog of if you want um, a computer that has X, Y, and Z attributes, here's a list of those that are available on the market. Certification systems are things like uh, through UL environment where you have a third party come and assess the product and actually say that yes, we give it our stamp of approval as a third, a third party observer that's objective and say yes, this is at such and such level. So EPEAT often I think is viewed from the consumer standpoint as being a certification, but it's not. It's really a registry. And so that's one thing that um, I think consumers really need to understand that just because it's labeled as EPEAT gold, that's great. That means that relative to other 
other products on the market. It's a better choice, but we still have to be informed consumers and really look at the manufacturer's claims and educate ourselves about other options and, and whether we think um, this, this product that's manufactured in this way is better than another or if there are other opportunities that the manufacturers are, are not pursuing that we would like them to pursue. So, it has guess, driven the members, uh, at least the people are not members, but uh, participating uh, in that uh, to, to get better, more energy efficient machines and all that sort of thing. They keep uh, gradually trying to up the standards yeah. each year. So it's working, but it's doing its job as well as it could probably not. But does it capture the sustainability criteria that you would apply to plants? Yes. I, I, yes. Yeah, yeah, but, and, and their guidelines. But again, I think it's done a lot in terms of bringing the idea of sustainable aspects of electronics to the minds of consumers, but there's definitely room for improvement and room for, for more education for consumers. This is a comment to tie back into Junela's question, Lauren's comment. Uh, recently, there was an RFP out for, we are looking for a program administrator to, for each to a certification program. So, so there are you know, opportunities that are coming, coming out. That, that's not for products, but that's for recyclers. Still good. Still good. Just wondering, uh, you know, we know that all the companies are making computers. They are going to benefit only, or they're going to grow only if they make new computers and things to replace the old ones. Okay? In fact, those are some of the, you know, some of the best companies to invest in the world. Which makes them think you know, that it would be foolish to say that they're going to stop, you know, make things longer and that sort of thing. However, by the same token, I think that that opens a great opportunity uh, to people like us, you know, and other business people that, uh, that might want to work not on trying to eliminate the waste, not to try to make sure that all these things are lasting longer, not to not find other low, low usage, you know, like uh, low level usage except in the other country. But I was wondering, there is an opportunity here to develop some technologies that allow you to eliminate the waste in a way that at the end it is uh, equivalent to our waste to what the profits of program. And now since all these uh, so since all since all the products are made almost about the same way. I have a, a wafer, I have a piece of metal, I have a, a kind of plastic material. Perhaps the, uh, the, the need is to try to standardize all those methods so that in the end somebody is able to go and, and burn them or you know, classify them or make oil so that they can go back and put it. And then in that way, you know, they have the new products, they have their profits, and then we also have jobs you know, that can't be formed you know, because of that. I think that the University of Illinois has a great opportunity right here, you know, if we were to focus in that direction. Well, that, that's an interesting point, but I would disagree about trying to make products last longer. I think that is the most valuable way to go. And actually, there are paradigms that Dell has even looked at themselves for um, changing the, the, the paradigm where you sell products to where you sell services so that the consumer doesn't actually own the device the company still owns the device and what you actually are purchasing as a consumer are the services. So you wouldn't own your cell phone necessarily, but you would you would own the services that the company would um, provide to you and you'd actually lease the actual device. In fact, I think that's how um, phones are, are treated in Europe. And as I said, Dell, I, I believe we've talked to Dell a little bit about that paradigm that they've considered. So there are other other ways to approach electronic device usage that, that can make the device itself last longer. We just have to accept that as a society. <laughs> and there are other societies that do approach electronic devices, devices that way. You know, harking back to when I was a kid, that if I wanted to go to the movies, I, I, took, I found some soda bottles, turned them back in, got enough money to go, go to the movies. Um, so, uh, you know, with the uh, uh, so perhaps the, the notion of, of ownership is, is just change, change for the company to still manufacture things. But the service, the software, all of that, I, I don't see the screen size changing much from a practical standpoint. You can get half that way for really portable, you know, the, the 
milk readers and all that, you can get about this size. But our eyes, uh, unless it's just to get bigger letter, lettering on them, but some basics I don't think are going to change. You know, your cell phone has to be big enough that you just don't lose it. You know, and that physiologically you, you can talk. We can do smaller things. But um, uh, but I think certainly the materials are lasting longer and, and, and is, a, is a good and an interesting approach. And I think it's going to take a multi-pronged approach to, to get at this problem. So I'm not saying that wouldn't reap some, some real benefits there to look at that materials that last longer that uh, are, are easier to take apart and reuse and simply just stay in the surface longer. But uh, Nokia tried this with cell phones with just the covers. It was very popular for a while. And they were very popular as a, as a cell phone. So I can make it look new just by changing the cover on it, as long as the thing works. Um, it's just uh, uh, we need to do the same thing in the interior of our products as well. All right, uh, and, and do some more conversation on this. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate your suggestions. Yes, thank you, sir. Thank you. So this will end today's seminar, and I hope to see you back on September 19th when we'll have a webinar with Kelly Babbitt from uh, Rochester Institute of Technology in New York. We'll be showing that here, and um, we'll see you then. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.